Right? And transformed into values. So it, uh, this reactive emotion and frustration uh, is given a moralized interpretation um, and is the basis for um, what become moral values. So fundamentally, um, the weak and powerless um, come to hate and resent the strong, the powerful, and the properties that are associated with them. So um, their enjoyment of strong physicality, their bodies, sex, food, their power, these things and the people who have them are in the minds of the weak and powerless who resent them, taken to be evil, taken to be sinful. Um, and the lack of these things, the denial of strong, powerful physicality, um, and the people who lack those things, are taken by this moral system to be good. Um, so fundamentally notice that morality and you know, the moral system of values is reactive. Uh, it's an attitude that starts with what it's rejecting uh, and as a second stage um, only in reaction comes to affirm something, maybe like the lack of those other things. And this is in contrast to the noble system of values that starts with, is fundamentally about, an affirmation. An affirmation of strength, physicality, um, an affirmation of <coughs> being in the empirical, physical world, and of course, fundamentally, an affirmation of themselves, of the ones who have these strengths and so, um, in section 11, very top of page 22, um, um, he points out that the good of morality, that is, those people and, and qualities that morality identifies as good, is not the same good as the noble value. It's not the same um, people and properties that the nobles think as think of as good. So he says, um, very top of 22, he says, just ask yourself who is actually evil, in quotes, in the sense of the morality of resentment. To answer in all strictness, precisely the good ones, in quotes, of the other morality, precisely the noble, the powerful, the ruling only recolored, reinterpreted, only reseen through the poisonous eye of resentment. Okay, so the ones that morality identifies as evil are exactly the ones that the noble system of values affirms as good. Um, so I said that the genealogy is ultimately concerned with identifying and describing and understanding the moral system of values, morality. Um, and I said that there's controversy about how, how broad or narrow to understand what he's talking about, what the system of moral values is. At one extreme, you might say it's just traditional Christian values of meekness and obedience and abstaining from pleasures, physical pleasures. So you should be thinking like maybe puritanical virtues of self-denial, um, puritanical values of self-denial. And there's no doubt that Nietzsche takes this to be the core of morality. Um, but you should be thinking and asking yourselves whether his understanding of the system of morality goes beyond that religious puritanical system of values, 
Uh, and if it does, whether taking those values as the core of morality um, is, is really right. Okay, so after that passage, we get um, the passage I spent some time on last time, talking about the um, dangers of the noble system of values. Um, so in the middle of page 22 is this passage about the powerful, um, noble ones who barely even recognize the weak at all. Remember, they are fundamentally concerned with affirming themselves rather than reacting to others. And they bear, and, and, and Nietzsche points out that they barely even recognize the weak and powerless. They often will act out, act out their power and force on them without even recognizing what it is that they're doing. Um, so they become, he says, um, in this passage, jubilant monsters who are, quote, not much better than uncaged beasts of prey. And they walk away from a hideous succession of murder, arson, rape, torture, with such high spirits and equanimity that it seems to them as if they've only played a student prank. Okay, so they're really blind to the, um, what it is that they're actually doing. You should remember, I mentioned in the introduction, that Nietzsche himself was a fraternity member for a brief period of time. He was completely disgusted by this and horrified by what was going on and, and quickly left. Um, so this is what he's associating this with, just simply blindly acting out without really understanding what we're going to do. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm emphasizing this to you again because Nietzsche should not be understood as himself uncritically affirming noble system of values. Of course he's critical of morality. He thinks that this has a great danger to us. Um, but um, he's not um, merely advocating throwing out morality and embracing the older noble system of values. Um, and I guess I should remit, remind you one more time that passage where he says that unless he's a fool, he does not think that we should simply affirm all that morality rejects and reject all that morality affirms. He thinks we should reject the moral system of values, but not simply reverse its assessment of various actions. Okay, so what is the danger of the moral system of values? Um, for Nietzsche, uh, at one time, perhaps, because of the, um, what I, the passages that I just talked about, that the blind acting out. Perhaps at one time it was uh, necessary in, in order to tame and discipline ourselves to prevent us from simply uh, loosing our power on the weak and vulnerable. Um, so at one point he thinks it very well may have been necessary to discipline and tame all this violent acting out. The formation of society very well may have required that. Um, so we'll see more about that in the next essay. But basically Nietzsche thinks that in modern European societies that's been done. In modern European societies that has been successfully carried out. And now, the values of repression, the values of self-discipline, the affirmation of self-denial, that is itself something that's become dangerous. Um, so here he says uh, on 23, so this is the very bottom of the page, 
it may be entirely justifiable if one cannot escape one's fear of the blonde beast at the base of all noble races and is on guard. So like, the blonde beast is like a lion who simply acts out its power on those who are weak. Right? So this is just like the um, rampaging nobles who think that what they've done is just a stupid so let me read that again. It may be entirely justifiable if one cannot escape one's fear of the blonde beast at the base of all noble races and is on guard to affirm morality, to try to discipline that kind of acting out. But who would not a hundred times sooner fear if he might at the same time admire than not fear but be able to escape the disgusting sight of the deformed, reduced, atrophied, poisoned. And is that not our duty? What causes our aversion, he asks, to man? Um, because, uh, for we suffer from man, there's no doubt. Not fear, rather that we have nothing left to fear in man, that the worm man is in the foreground in teeming, that the team of man this hopelessly mediocre and uninspiring being has already learned to feel himself as the goal and pinnacle, as the meaning of history, as higher. So the great danger to us, now that this beast has been disciplined, the great danger to us is that the values that led to this kind of self-discipline have left us with nothing positive to affirm. That we're suffering from, this is mediocrity. That there's no um, positive uh, inspiration to strive for. Um, we think that our ordinary, humdrum, mediocre existence is the only thing that matters, the only thing that's worth doing. This is the goal and the pinnacle and the meaning of history. <coughs> this is not it. So the great danger to us is not that we will um, act out our power in a blind and raging way. For us, the problem is exactly the opposite. Namely, that we are uninspired with no positive um, values to um, achieve. Bottom of page 24, section 12. For things stand thus. The reduction and equalization of the European human conceals our greatest danger, for this sight makes us tired. We see today nothing that wishes to become greater we sense that all that all sorry, we sense that things are still going downhill, downhill, into something thinner, more good natured, more prudent, more comfortable, more mediocre, more apathetic, more Chinese, more Christian. Man, there is no doubt, is becoming ever, quote, better. And precisely here lies Europe's doom. So the fact that we are um, Settle that things are so. Sorry, I mean, so there's this great list here. Um, things are becoming, he says, more good natured, prudent, comfortable, mediocre, apathetic. We could easily add to that list. We're forever increasing our utility. We're forever becoming more comfortable and satisfying our desires. And not only Nietzsche would reject the, um, necessarily reject the idea that, um, I mean, more prudent, good-natured, mediocre, apathetic, 